Yes, hello, it's me, Beast Priest, and it is spooky season. But I'm getting tired of hearing spooky stories. Every other content creator is out there trying to do something spooky. People seem to have forgotten that November 1 is not All Souls Day. What? It's All Saints Day. Yes, this holiday exists. So to remember the fact that saints in general and All Saints Day exist, we're gonna talk about this guy. He's a giant, he's a saint, and he has the head of a dog. Saint Christophorus, popularly known as Saint Christopher, is a relatively famous saint actually. Christians might know him because he's venerated in Roman Catholicism, Eastern and Oriental Orthodoxy, and some Protestant denominations like Lutheranism and Anglicanism. He is the patron saint of travelers, well, among many other things, who supposedly died in the reign of Roman Emperor Decius. Contextually, a long time ago, people believed that there were different races of humans. One of those human races are the dog-headed people, the Sinocephali. In the 5th century, historian and physician Theseus wrote about the Sinocephali in his book, Indica. On these mountains, there live men with the head of a dog whose clothing is the skin of wild beasts. They speak no language, but bark like dogs. They inhabit the mountain as far as the river Indus. They understand the Indian language but are unable to converse, only barking or making signs with their hands and fingers by way of reply. They are called by the Indians Kalistri. In Greek, Sinocephali, they live on raw meat. They number about 120,000. Mentions of the dog-headed people were not limited to the Theseus. Roman and Greek personalities mentioned them too. With the amount of literature surrounding these dog-headed men, it's unsurprising that people continue to believe in their existence all the way to the late medieval period. Enter one of these dog-headed men, Saint Christopher who, in some accounts, was originally called Reprobus, meaning the scoundrel. Reprobus was a Canaanite, supposedly towering 7.5 feet tall, and was said to be stronger than most men. People feared and respected him because of his stature and strength. Thinking no one was like him in terms of bodily vigor, he resolved to serve only the greatest king there was. So he traveled, far and wide, looking for a king worthy of his strength. First, he met a brave king, and Reprobus offered to serve him, until one day, an entertainer came to visit the king's castle. One of the songs he sang before the king's court was about the power of Satan. When the devil was mentioned, the king made the sign of the cross, blessing himself. Reprobus huh? saw this and asked, uh, why did you do that? Do what? The thing with your hands. Oh, the sign of the cross? When I make this sign, Satan has no power over me. Oh, so you're afraid of Satan? Then he is stronger than you, and he deserves my service, not you. Much to the dismay of the king, Reprobus left. This time, he came upon a band of raiders, one of whom was a pretentious little f**k who called himself Satan. I'm a pretentious little f**k who called myself Satan. Oh, sweet, I was just looking for you. Uh, what? Let me serve you. Wow, well, okay. So Reprobus served this poser for quite some time. But one day, he saw his new king avoid a cross on the road. Nope. Uh? Eventually, Reprobus realized that his new king was afraid of a man named Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is here! And much to the dismay of the fake Satan, Reprobus left. He traveled again, asking the people, where he could find Christ. In a forest near a river, Reprobus found a hermit who had the answers he was looking for. The hermit instructed Reprobus of the Christian way, telling him about Jesus and his holy life. When Reprobus fully understood Christianity, the hermit baptized him. If you want to serve Christ, you must pray and fast. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, no, what do you mean, no? I'm not proud of my great size and strength, but I am still huge and strong. Uh, so? I get hungry. Quickly. Mo. Oh. Is there some other way? Well, there is the bridgeless river next door. People die when they try to cross it. With your great size and strength, you can ferry people through it. The river was broad and long and swift. Its current was fast and unforgiving. Yeah, why can't I just build a bridge? This is an important part of your legend, trust me. Henceforth, day and night, whenever he was called, Reprobus faithfully performed the task assigned to him. One night, there came a child. A child. Hello, Mr. Doghead. 
Oh, hi. Do you want to cross the river? Yes, please. Reprobus quickly moved, placing the child on his stout shoulder. With his staff, he walked into the mighty current. During the crossing, the water rose higher and higher, and the child became heavier and heavier. Ugh, you're getting heavy, bro. <laughs> Wee! When he finally reached the other side, he said to the child, You have put me in the greatest danger. I do not think the whole world could have been as heavy on my shoulders as you were. You had on your shoulders not only the whole world, but him who made it. I am Christ, your king, whom you are serving by this work. Henceforth, you shall be known as Christophorus. Then the child vanished. As the child disappeared into thin air, so did the canine features of Christopher's face. Whoa. Christopher served the Lord faithfully, becoming a zealous preacher of the gospel, converting many to the faith. Through his mission, he came upon Lycia, where after his first ever sermon, 18,000 heathens, really? 18,000? 18,000 heathens requested baptism. Emperor Lysias heard of this and sent a company of 400 soldiers to capture Christophorus. To these, he preached so convincingly that they all asked for baptism. Decius became even more enraged, but he eventually succeeded in capturing the preacher. At first, Christopher was treated with great kindness and was surrounded with every luxury to tempt him to sin. Nope. But the king could not break Christopher. So the king sent two beautiful women to seduce him. Christopher, once again, preached so convincingly to the harlots that they both converted to Christianity. I'm sick of you. I can do this all day. Christopher was tortured so he would deny the faith. He was cursed, plates on plates of hot iron, boiling oil was poured over him, and fire was lit under him. It didn't work, and Christopher remained loyal to God. So the king ordered his soldiers to shoot him with arrows, which also didn't work. Christopher was beheaded on July 25th. The name Christophorus, of course, means Christ bearer. Saint Christopher is the patron saint of many, many places. As the patron saint of travelers, travelers would, of course, sport his iconography, and Saint Christopher is often depicted in different ways. Sometimes he would be depicted as a giant holding a staff on one hand and a child Christ atop his shoulder. Christopher is sometimes depicted with the head of a dog. So with all this legend and popularity in mind, can we say for certain that Saint Christopher truly existed? In my research, I found an article from the British Dental Journal about Saint Christopher's supposed tooth which was larger than a fist. In the late Middle Ages, friars found the tooth and placed it on display in a church in the town of Vercelli. It attracted pilgrims from all parts of Europe who venerated it. At the end of the 18th century, a naturalist came to analyze the relic who found that the tooth was a tooth of a hippopotamus. The tooth was then locked away and its public veneration was forbidden. But the story doesn't end there. In 1969, Pope Paul VI issued the Misteri Pascalis, an apostolic letter that revised the liturgical year and the liturgical celebrations of saints in the Roman calendar. In effect, around 93 saints were demoted, including Saint George, the one who fought a dragon, Saint Nicholas, the inspiration for Santa Claus, and Saint Christopher. But what does it mean for a saint to be demoted? I found this newspaper. Is it a newspaper? I found this newspaper called the Catholic Transcript, dated July 11, 1969. There's a section dedicated to the most asked questions regarding the Misteri Pascalis. I still can't understand what happened to saints like Christopher and Barbara. Are they totally erased from the calendar? How can the church do such a thing? For Pope Paul VI, there were too many feasts and vigils in the liturgical calendar that he wanted the faithful to focus their attention to the most fundamental mysteries of the faith. The second answer is that Pope Paul wanted to formulate a new list of saints but only for saints, quote unquote, of truly universal significance. And finally, and perhaps the most scathing for Saint Christopher, is that Pope Paul VI wanted to omit from the liturgical cycle of feast or commemorations, any previously venerated saint whose history as handed down is suspect. Changing the liturgical calendar basically means that there are saints who might not be as realistic as other saints. So what does this mean for Catholics who have offered their devotions to Saint Christopher and the 92 other saints who have been removed from the liturgical calendar? The removal of certain saints from the church's calendar doesn't mean that they can no longer be privately venerated. 
Basically, the Pope just wanted the faithful to refocus their devotion. Personally, knowing all of this, I don't think he's real, but he does represent a specific reality. According to Jonathan Pijo, a professional artist, writer, and public speaker, the image of dog-headed men has been used time and time again to represent a foreigner. Here's an illustration of the Pentecost, a holiday that celebrates that one time the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles and other followers of Jesus Christ. A dog-headed man represents the farthest race present at Pentecost, what Pijo called the image of the ultimate foreigner. In this next image, dog-headed men are used to represent the barbarian enemies who threaten Christ. Well, what about the giant part of St. Christopher's iconography, you ask? The giants in the Bible and in Christian tradition are often interpreted as descendants of Cain and monstrous cannibal barbarians who, by their excessive bodies, represent the extreme of corporality itself. This is very telling. So both giants and dog-headed men represent violent foreigners in the eyes of early Christians. There's even a very relevant analogy in Samuel 1 chapter 17. When Goliath saw David, he specifically asked, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? It all makes sense now. So what does all of this mean for St. Christopher? If St. Christopher is real, then there really is a race of dog-headed men in the world. But if St. Christopher simply represents a reality in the eyes of early Christians in the past, then Christopher, as the Christ-bearer, represent foreigners being the vehicles for advancing the church to the ends of the earth. I believe this is the early Christian's way of saying to barbarians that, hey, if you convert, we won't judge you for who you were or what you did before, because one of our most loved saints was one of you. A surprisingly wholesome ending for the story of a saint who did not have a wholesome ending. I hope you like this deep dive into St. Christopher. I know I did. Doing research was fun, especially when I found primary sources. But a lot of effort went into this video, so I hope you like, comment, and subscribe. If you want more deep dives like this, let me know, because there are a lot of weird saints out there. Happy Halloween, or Happy Saints Day. Is that a thing? Happy Saints Day. Cheers.